getting it? Oh my god, wait, I'm so excited. Welcome to part two of reading Wattpad fanfiction starring me and my canine cyborg boyfriend. If you clicked on this video by accident and you have no context or any clue for what's going on, I mean, the title pretty much reveals itself. It's me and my canine cyborg boyfriend. Like, how can I make it any more clearer than that? If you haven't seen part one, I will link it in my description below, or I will catch you up to what has happened. Basically, I read the first half of the fanfiction, which was the first six chapters. The fanfiction stars me as a tattoo shop owner. There is a dog named Barkley who visits me every day with like a flower in his mouth. He's kind of like a stray dog, but not really. He technically belongs to this flower shop owner who is literally named Karen and she acts like a Karen, but she's very neglectful towards him. So I have really been the only positive force in his life and he falls for me, but he's only a dog and he wishes that he could be a human and be the man that I deserve. And then he wishes on a falling star and he does become a man slash cyborg slash kind of a dog, kind of a furry, but not really. Like he's technically human on the outside. So we don't have to go into any shady territory. That's how he transforms from a dog named Barkley to a hot man named Ben. As a human, he tries to court me. He has a lot of himbo energy as a lot of dogs do. And I'm kind of bitchy to him in the beginning, but then I start to warm up to him and we have a good thing going on. But there's like also some kind of side thing going on with him and Mateo, who is his roommate. He also has a crush on me apparently, but I don't buy it because I'm seeing more chemistry between Ben and Mateo than with me. Last time we left off on part one, Karen was was really mad that Ben is into me. She gets super jealous and the end of the chapter hints that she transforms into a monster because she was starting to think, oh, well, if everyone thinks I'm a monster, I'm gonna start to become one, you know? And I'm like, okay, Gabby, Hannah, pack it up. So now I will be reading the rest of the fan fiction and finishing it. And what I've heard from the wonderfully talented writer is that there will be smut and tentacles, which I'm super excited to dive into because you know I love me some smut. Not so keen on the tentacles, but you know what? It's fan fiction. We should just go wild and crazy with it. That was my main complaint during part one. There was no smut scenes. It wasn't steamy enough. Even in my own rated M fan fiction, I am still getting cobwebs down there and not getting any action. So hopefully part two is gonna redeem itself. The author said that there would be smut scenes. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm getting pretty excited to read it. And you know what I do when I feel really worked up? I start to get hungry and I start to really wanna snack on something. So you you know, just to match with my whetted appetite. <laughs> I don't know why I pronounced it like that, but anyway, I'm working up an appetite, getting to read all these steamy scenes, getting this workout. So it would be only fitting for me to snack on a bunch of things like from Boxu, which is the sponsor of this video. Boxu is a monthly snack box subscription service that delivers original assortments of premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings. Every month you'll receive a box with different themes. The snacks will always be different. It's a gourmet journey through Japan every month. This month, the box that I got is Autumn Harvest, which means that it brings a lot of classic fall flavors like sweet potatoes and mushroom, apples and grapes, seeds and nuts. Just like how we're gonna read about seeds and nuts in this fan fiction, but you know what? I'm not gonna continue any further because this is supposed to be a professional sponsorship. Anyway, the point is there's a lot of unique flavor to the season's dishes and snacks. Subscription includes free shipping and tracking from Japan to over 40 countries. That's right, it's coming all the way from Japan and it still has free shipping. What a goddamn steal. If you're interested, you can get 10% off, which is saving up to $44 of your own authentic Japanese snack box from Boxu using my link in the description below and using my code READWITHCINDY10. Now that our appetites are whetted, let's read the fanfiction. Being a tattoo shop owner, Cindy often kept an irregular schedule. Though they were both meeting very early, she still hadn't slept from the night before. She was excited to see Ben again and had just dyed the fringe of her hair purple. Oh my god! What a coincidence! I also recently dyed my hair purple. Oh my god, this was meant to be right here. She picked out some comfortable but snug tights and a cute colorful t-shirt with vector designs. This is perfect. This is already lining up very well. So the chapter talks about the cafe in the early morning. It's describing all of the desserts and trees that are in the cafe. Wow, again, this is just super fitting considering the sponsorship of this video. Elby and Patrick are the owners of the cafe. They are self-described animal people who have five fur babies of their own. No, they're not furries. They just have three guinea pigs and two dogs. They're asking, I heard you're living with Mateo. How's that going? Of course they would be asking about Mateo and not me. 
team. Everyone just wants to know about Mateo. Everyone wants to know how Mateo's doing, not how I'm doing. Even though I'm the main character of this fan fiction, I'm still the side character and I'm bitter about it. And yeah, I know Mateo has a crush on me, but whatever. Shut the fuck up, Mateo. I know you're gay for Ben. Ben explains how he quit Karen's shop and he says, you didn't get me in trouble. I think she was mad. I guess she found out dot dot dot. He trailed off, scratching the back of his neck. He was too embarrassed to admit what Karen had found out and even more embarrassed of how he acted, what he said. What? She nudged his shoulder against his. I don't even know. She said she found out I was dating you. It made her really angry. I guess she thought me and her were, I don't even know. He looked at Cindy. Are we dating? What does that even mean? This is all new to me, literally. We're just getting to know each other, I suppose. Cindy bit her bottom lip. Do you want to be, you know, defining the relationship already? Before Ben can respond, the laundry machines end up going crazy because he had put one piece of dirty laundry into each machine and he dumped huge portions of washing liquid in and letting them rip. So he's just making a mess everywhere. White froth, slick and soapy, envelope the floor, piling higher and higher to their ankles. See, this is the kind of shit that I was hoping to read about, but not this kind of white froth. Not the kind from a laundry machine. How dare you describe something as slick and soapy and I'm not even getting any action. Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because the floor is getting slippery, I end up losing my balance. Ben tried to catch her, but she brought him down with her. Within a split second and with a loud thud, Ben had landed on his back and Cindy landed on top of him. Oh, okay. So I'm a top now? Interesting. I feel like you know what, I'm not gonna say it. Their bodies pressed against each other as the suds formed around them. Cindy's face was furled with concern, but Ben somehow didn't seem phased by the land. He peered up with her with a half-lidded grin. Their faces were just inches away from one another. She became hyper aware of their breathing, sank together and flustered. Ben's strong arms wrapped around her instinctually, holding her tight against him. Can I kiss you? He whispered. Cindy's heart fluttered, her cheeks flushed. Yes. <gasps> A man who asks for consent beforehand? The bar is so low. Their lips met. It started out as a firm kiss, simple and warm. Then their bodies melted together, lips parting and tongues meeting to express secret longings neither wanted to admit out loud. Her breath was ragged when one of his hands found its way to her hair, running his fingers through it and gently tugging. Ow. The bubbles around them gently fizzing and dampening their clothes. She softly pulled away and gazed into his eyes. He gazed at her with sheer adoration, which caught her off guard. Then she smiled and the last sunbeams of the morning radiated through the laundromat's windows, wrapping her in a warm glow. Cindy, he sighed happily. All right, okay, okay. We get in some tongue action. Nice, nice. That's what I'd like to see. Hopefully we can amp it up moving forward. Chapter eight, we are back with Mateo. He's being emo right now because he sees Ben and Cindy walking hand in hand. Mateo's heart felt a pang, his stomach in knots. Hadley was working beside him at the counter, her eyes following his. Before she could say anything, he ran out to the back to get some air. Yes, Mateo, I know you're heartbroken. I know you're jealous, but it's not because of me, okay? It's because of your man that you have had more chemistry with in this entire fan fiction than with me. So let me have some of that ass, okay? It sucks, Hadley sighed and leaned against the wall with him. Did he know how you felt about her? Mateo blinked, staring at Hadley. He had never told her how he felt about Cindy. Oh, please, you didn't tell her how you felt about me because you feel nothing for me. You only feel gay things for Ben you fucking fake imposter. Why don't you go play Among Us, you imposter? Please, she snorted. You stare at her every time she comes in, and I always see you with the books she reads a week or two after I see her reading them. Damn, does that mean he read A Court of Thorns and Roses? That sucks. He's really suffered a lot through me. No, he didn't know. Ben's a good guy. You're a good guy too, Mateo, and you deserve to be happy. He rolled his eyes, crossing his arms and pushing his back into the wall. No one blames you for what happened to Bianca. You were 16 and it was a senseless, tragic accident. Who the fuck is Bianca? <laughs> okay, so we're diving into his background story, his tragic past. His first high school year, he met Hadley and Bianca. They were twin sisters. Oh, okay, so Bianca was his childhood sweetheart. Apparently she got into some accident. I mean, that sucks, but how is that relevant to my story? <laughs> okay, now there's thunder and lightning and rain. Ben and I are yelping and holding each other's hands tightly. Oh, but then while we're running, suddenly a deafening screech echoed in the air. Ooh, I think this is where 
maybe the octopusy comes in. Not my octopusy, I mean Karen, because I think she's like a monster now. At the end of three, countless oozing translucent tendrils unfurled before them. It was a great monster the size of a four-story building. It stretched out its tentacles like an undulating jellyfish. At its center was a great eye amidst a forest of limbs. In between its limbs were small holes, which seemed to be the source of its screeches. You know, I thought that this was going to be a story about my small holes, but instead we're reading about a tentacle monster. And again, I still haven't gotten any action. Ugh, this better be relevant later. We better have like an orgy or something. Holy shit, Ben shouted, halting in his tracks and pulling Cindy behind him. Clearly hanging around Cindy was influencing his vocabulary. Drenched, they both squinted, trying to make out the chaos that was unraveling before them. I'm not trying to kink shame, but what the fuck, Cindy shouted back. You know what? I don't kink shame. At least Karen's small holes are actually relevant to the story instead of mine. So if anything, I'm kind of kink envious. Before they could turn to run, one of the enormous tentacles stretched out and wrapped around Cindy. It twisted her body, slowly squeezing slimy suction cups pressed against her skin. All right, okay, you know what? I'll take it, I'll take it. It's not what I'm personally into, but you know what? It's been such a goddamn long time since I've had any action, I will take this. <sighs> not Karen touching me more than Ben did. God damn it. Ben's GUI flicked on, removing the obstacle of sight and scanning the area. He felt the coils under his skin and the steel on his bones kick into overdrive, heating as they expanded his muscles. Let her go, he growled wolfishly. His voice boomed down the streets as rain poured down his face. Without even thinking, his instinct kicked in as another tentacle reared upwards and tried to slam its meaty flesh down on him. <sighs> I want to read about meaty flesh, but not like this. Not like this. Why is Ben getting more meaty flesh than I am? This is ridiculous. He clenched his fist, shoving it into the squid-like limb and feeling his hot, heavy fist tear into the layers of muscle fiber. Why is there more intimacy going on in this battle scene with this octopus than any scene with him and my octopus? You know, I'm getting very upset right here. The monster screeched, this time in agony as it reared more tentacles to strike. One of those tendrils held Cindy. She screamed as the beast raised her in the air like a horrific tilt a whirl. Each time a tentacle swooped towards his head, he'd reach for it, tearing each one apart as if they were pieces of paper. But it was not without consequence. Several weighty tentacle chunks were being flung aside, collapsing parked cars or destroying nearby street lamps. Ben pushed up his purple blood stained sleeves and snarled. His umber eyes turned to a blood red glow. He sprinted towards the belly of the beast, lunging forward into his singular cyclops eye which blinked angrily at him. The cyborg used all his strength to land a killing blow to the creature. The brunt force of the punch sent the creature spiraling backwards as a great body raised even taller before flinging Cindy from his arm. Ben panicked, racing forward and exhausting every piece of technology and muscle in his body to reach her in time. He stretched his arms out, barely catching and cradling her against him as she cried out in shock. That was me crying out in shock that I haven't gotten laid yet. <laughs> it tried desperately to grasp at buildings and trees, but its limbs were torn or wounded. It fell backwards into the budding romance. A catastrophic noise clapped in the air like thunder, but it was the weight of the monster flattening the storefront. You know what? I wish Ben would clap these ass cheeks like thunder. As if an unseen force burned it, the tentacle creature began to curl inward upon itself and melt into a gelatinous ooze. The ooze seeped into the crushed flower shop, vanishing from view as quickly as it had appeared. The rain was starting to light up and Cindy stared at Ben, gasping for air. <sighs> People began to emerge from the shops, shouting and rushing to the flower shop to see if anyone needed help, but the chaos around them was a blur. Take me home, her voice husky. And he did. <gasps> Ooh, are we getting it? Are we getting it? Oh my god, wait, I'm so excited. Oh my god. <clears throat> The door to Cindy's house slammed shut as she pulled at Ben's expensive clothes, dragging him to the bathroom in between passionate kisses. Buttons were ripped off, clothes were torn, and at least one zipper was broken. Cindy kicked off her shoes and blindly reached for the hot water handle. The shower erupted with piping hot, clean water. Ben did not need self-convincing to come in this time. Underneath the steam, Cindy's hands explored his body, soaping up hard muscles and tracing quickly healing wounds. They took their time watching the mess of the attack and getting to know each other in brand new ways. Ben found new places to touch her. He lifted her chin with one hand as the water poured down, meeting his mouth to hers. Wait, how are we not choking on the water? Like, I'm trying to picture how this works. We're in the middle of a shower, right? He's tilting my chin up. My mouth had to open to kiss him. Wouldn't I be like... <laughs> I 
I hate that I made that noise in a video and I'm still gonna keep that clip in. His tongue lashing into her mouth. He was hard against her, ready to please in any way she wanted. His strong arms lifted her body. He was so in tune with her desires, he took her from the shower and carried her into the bedroom. He laid her out on the bed, hovering over her and admiring her beauty. What, she gasped, self-conscious from the shifted focus of his attention. You are just so fucking beautiful, he whispered, and then followed her into bed. He was created to please her, to unlock her, and to serve her to bliss. He started at her neck, hot breath and warm kisses, a tongue trailing to her chest between two breasts which were tenderly admired. Thank you. I don't have that much on me, because I'm just an A cup, maybe like a zero cup, but I appreciate the attention. He listened to each soft sigh. <sighs> paid attention to the blush in her cheeks, and let her guide him further down her stomach. His fingers traced her slender frame. He got to spread, wait, he got to, wait, he got to her spread legs. Why, why was that so hard for me to read? You know what, it's been so long that I can't even read smut anymore because I'm like, wait, how does this work? How does the mechanics work? I'm spreading my legs, okay? They're open wide, hallelujah. He licked his lips and didn't hesitate. His tongue found just the right spots, applying just the right pressure and consistency. She savored each tongue lash until her pleasure climaxed. Wow. When the time was right, he gently slid into her. Yes. This is what I'm fucking talking about right here. Their eyes met, blood pulsed, and hearts pumped in unison. His pace was slow at first, but passion soon took over. A growl erupted from deep in his throat. He held her face, gazing into her eyes as the tension built with each powerful thrust. They spent hours tracing and retracing their steps as the lust and passion gradually weaned them off the adrenaline high. They eventually accumulated in a tired, sweaty, happy mess of limbs, and not once, did he blow on her pussy? What a way to end this chapter. If you don't know what the last line is in reference to, it was in reference to this video that I made about Nevernight because there was a sex scene where the main male character was blowing air on the main female character's vagina and I was like, wait, why, how does this work? Why is he doing that? What, what does that do for the girl? And then my comment section went into this whole disarray where people were arguing about whether it was dangerous to blow air on your pussy or not. It was weird, I don't know, you're just gonna have to check the comment section. There was a lot of discourse about it, which frankly is the only discourse I'm willing to engage on on book two. Chapter nine starts with slick slime dripping from the AC vent and down the wall of Karen's cheap one bedroom apartment. <laughs> Your apartment ain't the only slick slime dripping down. <laughs> So the chapter is starting with Karen just sobbing in the bathtub. She's heartbroken. Oh, wait, I actually feel kind of bad for her. Her mind casts back to the time before all this mess, a time before she even owned a flower shop, and further still, before the trail of heartbreak and pain she left in her wake. Karen remembered Luca, devilishly handsome with a storm of green in his hazel eyes and a cruel twist to his smirk. Wait, why are we getting Karen's background story now? Who the fuck is Luca? I guess she was in some toxic relationship with him. Everyone in this story has a tragic background story but me. Why do I literally have no death? Except for my pussy. <laughs> he had pulled her into this world by showering her with affection. She was young, she was hopelessly in love, she was everything she had seen in Cindy's eyes when she looked at Ben. It was a hope that the future might not be so bad, that it might not be so lonely. Um, <laughs> when have my eyes ever expressed any thought that things wouldn't be so bad? I've never thought positively about the future, so. This ain't realistic. She had two options left, to self-destruct or to change. Well, you know what, Karen? I hope you change. Because the only thing that's gonna self-destruct is my pussy. Now we are in the Tequila Mockingbird restaurant. LB is asking me if I heard about the flower shop. Apparently there was a tentacle monster wrecking Second Street. 
It's so tragic, there was a gas leak and the whole building exploded. LB shook her head, putting one hand on her chubby cheek. Thankfully, no one was inside. They found Karen at her apartment. Still, it has to be so terrible picking up the pieces like that. Cindy, myself, is surprised that it happened because I guess when I was in the middle of having hot, steamy sex, I didn't notice there was another earthquake happening around here. Who knew there was also mountains trembling around my perimeters? Not me, I was too busy getting it on. Everything had been such a blur and she still didn't know what to make out of any of it. Ben was such a calming presence that she hadn't even thought to ask questions. She had just been blinded by hormones and adrenaline, but maybe she should be asking questions. You know, like what the fuck? Domingo, who is the restaurant owner, is making conversation with me and welcoming me, asking when am I going to be bringing in a boyfriend? I'm asking him, what about yourself? I see how you look at Naomi and how she always seems to be in here lingering. So I'm like playfully teasing back with him. This is more socialization that I've done in like a whole year. Oh, Naomi is a transgender character. Character. Okay, so this is where we see more of the LGBT plus representation. She's a transgender mayor. Good for her. Life is too damn short to not be happy. Cindy's eyes rested on Domingo. Everyone wants to see you happy, Domingo. Especially me. I mean, I don't even know Domingo, but sure. Maybe I'm just riding off of that high of finally getting laid, so I'm just like, you know what? Everyone deserves to be happy. Ooh, wait a minute. Now Domingo is giving me advice and he says, you should talk to Mateo. He's a good kid, hard worker, he's single. Mateo, Cindy blinked, her eyes moving to spy on the aforementioned chef through the far order window. She had a handful of interactions with him, none of which would ever indicate anything of the sort. He is shy, keeps his head down. You know, lightning killed his childhood sweetheart in front of him when he was 16, Hadley's twin sister. Wait, what the? That's such like an abrupt introduction. Like imagine some dude is like, hey, you know what? You should date this guy. He used to date this chick, but she died from lightning. I don't know, it seems like a good match between you two. He enlisted in the army when he was 18 and came back three years later. I don't ask, he doesn't tell me, but I know he wanted to escape all the painful memories, but you can't run away from the past. Wow, Cindy's eyes were wide. I had absolutely no idea. While I'm also thinking internally, why the fuck is he telling me this guy's whole life story? Isn't that kind of invasive? Keep it between you and me. Just try to smile at him once in a while. He's looking good and sweet. You might like him. Domingo patted Cindy on the shoulder. Between you and me, eh? I don't know. It sounds like uh, Mateo has a lot of baggage going on. I don't know if I can compete with an ex that literally got killed by lightning. Whereas Ben is just like a simple dumb dog. Unless we have a threesome, I don't know, let's see what happens. Mayor Naomi is kind of really stressed right now and I'm asking her, is everything okay? And she says, everything is a wreck. The high school band all have mono. Bill from Bill's Bowling Emporium broke his leg so he can't finish the commencement stage. Or has got loose and we can't find the damn thing. And Tanya's psychic then pulled out at the last moment. Cindy, I need you. Okay, and what do you want me to do about that? <laughs> Star Falls 15th annual chili cook-off bonanza. Can I count on you to bring a big batch of chili? Bitch, I don't know how to cook. Why do I have to do it? I don't know how to cook chili. Yeah, see? Exactly. So she mentions there's a $5,000 cash prize and then I finally say, fine. That's realistic. Ooh, they're suggesting, why don't I ask Mateo for help at the diner? Ooh, is this where I'm gonna get close to Mateo? Ooh, am I gonna get sexy with Mateo? Oh my gosh, let's do round two. Okay, so I am borrowing Ben for a minute to talk alone, and I say, Ben, we need to talk about what happened yesterday. Her voice was serious and low. I'm game for a repeat. Ben gave a big grin, thumbing the handle of his broom. Hell yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Damn, I wanna be that broom that you thumb. No, I mean, she motioned down the street. What happened? Like, how are you able to kill a giant land squid monster? Why was there a land squid monster? And what are you? Why am I asking all these irrelevant questions? He just said he was down for round two. Come on, fan fiction, Cindy. Think of your priorities. I, I, Ben choked. He should have expected all these questions, but the monumental finale of yesterday overshadowed all the horror. Look, I have an hour left on my shift. Can we talk about this later? His eyes were full of fear, fear of losing her, please. I am walking past the Killer Mockingbird. I noticed there is a light on and there's movement in the kitchen. So I decide to knock on the glass. I think that I'm looking for Ben, but in actuality, when I pull the door open, it's actually Mateo cooking. I came in to ask him if he can help me make chili. So he's giving the ingredients to me in the boxes and I'm packing it up. And then he says, you want a taste? He mumbled slowly. It took her a few seconds to understand what he said. He dipped a clean spoon into the curry as she stepped over it off 
offered it to her. Mateo held the spoon steady as she took a sip. She softly blew on the spoon's bowl and wrapped her lips around it. It was aromatic. She could taste the lime juice and coconut, the meaty tomato and the garlic chicken thighs. He carefully watched her for a reaction. When her eyes met his, she sputtered. She knew that look. It was how Ben looked at her. Why had she never seen it before? How long had he been looking at her like that? Too spicy, he inquired, putting the spoon aside. No, no, it's perfect. Um, thanks. I should get going. Oh, please. Have you seen how Mateo looks at Ben? Yeah, right. Okay, so Ben is going to sleep. Mateo's there because they share an apartment together. But he is kind of being angsty right now. And he's asking, have you ever had a secret? One you know would end any chances you had as someone you love with every bench hooked a sob. <laughs> every part of you. You know, it's not that deep. It's not really that much of a deal breaker for you to be a dog. Like, I love dogs. If anything, that would be a plus. Now, Mateo is gonna give us some of his tragic background story. I've never told anyone this, ever, he began. When I was 16, I fell in love with a girl. She loved to read, just like me, and her sister was my best friend. I think you've met Hadley? Anyway, we were at a party out by the creek where their waterfall meets the river. A couple of us decided to go camping in the state park just north outside of town. Me, Bianca, Hadley, and her then boyfriend. Hadley and her boyfriend decided to skinny dip in the river, but me and Bianca wanted to go stargazing at the top of the fall. The stars are so vibrant up there. It's, we were climbing up the incline and Bianca was ahead of me. She pointed to a shooting star and before I could even look up, Mateo closed his eyes tight. A bolt of lightning struck Bianca. We both fell and she was gone. But what I don't tell people is that I saw her. When we fell off the cliff, I had residual burns. Bianca and her boyfriend were running up. We all saw it. Bianca's body lay blistered and dead on the ground, but, but she was also in the air floating upward. Her body was glowing, see-through. It floated all the way up to the sky and vanished. Um... What the fuck? <laughs> this is like some kind of paranormal shit. What's going on? We swore none of us would tell anyone what happened to her. Who would believe us? There was no rain, no storm. It's, it's insane. It's crazy. It's not crazy. I believe you. It felt like Ben shot an arrow into Mateo's heart. Of course he shot an arrow through his heart. Cupid's arrow. Why are they bonding over the tragic past besides me? Man, I'm not gonna get laid again anymore, aren't I? I think this is the last chapter. This is chapter 11 before we get to the author's note. Karen is going inside the bakery. She feels bad about what she did and the owner tells her, you know, funny enough, a sincere apology goes a long way with most people. I know Cindy loves free food. It's true. I'm very easy to buy off. I heard we're doing a 12 for $12 sale on donuts. 12 for $12 sale? That's a good deal. Why didn't he tell me about that sale? Why'd he tell Karen? I can do that for myself. Time skip. We're setting up a bunch of chili tasting booths. Karen is coming up to me and she says, I screwed up. I was selfish and cruel. What I did was horrible and spiteful. I feel terrible about it. I'm not here to make you feel better. Cindy's voice was full of biting anger. You tried to ruin my reputation and my livelihood. And what's crazy is I barely even know you. I've never done anything to you or your business. Ooh. This is giving me flashbacks with the other Karens on booktube. <laughs> I can't make any excuses for my behavior. I lost my temper. I thought Ben liked me and no, I expected him to reciprocate my feelings. I tried to manipulate him. I tried to ruin you. I fucked up. I am trying to be better. I can't ask you to forgive me, but I want you to know I'm sorry. She put the box of donuts on the table. I accept that apology. At least for one thing, she's taking accountability for her actions. She's actually apologizing to me and she just gave me free donuts. That is way more than what other people have done for me after being bitchy for no reason. So uh, to all the Karens out there, maybe you should take some notes from this Karen and give me a box of donuts, specifically Krispy Kreme. The chili cook-off bonanza is now in full swing. The sun is starting to set. Rainbow flags marked pathways between chili booths. Ooh, a very progressive town. We love to see it. Ooh, okay, Ben is finally gonna tell me his secret. You were right that I had not been completely honest with you. I was up all night trying to figure out how to tell you. I know that once you find out who I really am, that you probably won't look at me the same. You brought me food. You held me. You showed me kindness when others did not. I fell in love with you before you ever knew me as Ben, before I was human. I can't explain it. I've loved you for so long. One night I made a wish on a falling star and I woke up like this. He motioned to his body. Not exactly human, but whatever it is I am, Superman or a cyborg, it's who I am now. I just hope that you might find it in your heart to look past who I was. Cindy was speechless. Tiny moments between them started to make sense with this newfound information. All the time she had to explain even the most basic things to him, how he seemed to know her so well when they met, and the flowers. Oh, the flowers. 
Her eyes met his and she could see the truth. It had always been there, but she didn't see a helpless, practically stray dog. She saw who he was now, a man who loved her, a man who protected her, a man who would do anything to keep her, even tell her the truth. There was no need for words. She flung her arms around his neck, pressing herself against his firm body. Their lips met. Their kiss was different. It was tender, expressive, and knowing. Yeah, see? It wasn't even that deep. He literally just told me he was a dog and I'm like, all right, let's still tap that. I love you, Cindy said softly. She stood on her tippy toes, sharing a sweet chili kiss and then wiping his mouth with a napkin. Behind them, a few celebratory fireworks set off, crackling and exploding in the sky. In the background, the band played a cover of Slow Burn by Casey Musgraves as fireworks occasionally crackled above. That is oddly specific, but okay. Mateo's eyes found Cindy and Ben in the crowd. He sighed. He knew it was time for a change for him too. He had realized that he didn't have any claim to Cindy just because he knew her first. It was his fault he never went for it. It. He held on too tightly to the pain of his past and he blew it big time. But that wasn't Ben's fault. Ben was his friend and Mateo wasn't going to stand in their way. I mean, you could still have a threesome with us. I don't know why that's considered mutually exclusive. Mateo just handed Karen the prize money? Why does she have a happier ending than all of us? Like, yeah, we may have found love, but she has a shit ton of money. <gasps> wait a minute. Oh my God. Wait, there's some kind of twist going on. I thought this was the last chapter, but things just got kind of juicy. So I am in the tattoo parlor right now. And then a tall man walks in dressed in black. His hair was slicked back and his tan skin had olive undertones. He already had a complicated tattoo of a Japanese serpent dragon made up of constellations on one of his muscular arms. The historic pagoda style parlor seemed to come alive when he walked in. He leaned up against the counter, giving a wry smile. His eyes were bright green, full of magic and mischief. I have an appointment. He had a thick Italian accent. His voice was playful. What's your name? Cindy asked, checking the appointment time slot. Luca. The tattoo parlor's playlist switched to a new song. The familiar guitar intro to Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple started to play. The end? Question mark. Oh snap, I did not expect us to end on a cliffhanger. Let's read the author's note. K9 Cyborg Boyfriend was intended to be a 5 to 10 page fanfiction. It was inspired by YouTube booktuber Rita with Cindy's video titled Ranking My Subscribers Kink. She also reviewed several of her own favorite shows. By the end of the video, I left the comments. Incoming fluff fanfic featuring alternative universe tattoo artist Cindy and a happy go lucky dog human hybrid cyborg who runs a flower shop and is thrust into a bodyguard situation when Cindy must be protected from tentacle monsters. At first, it was a joke, but then the writing prompt got me to thinking what would that fanfic look like? Ideas and scenes bubbled in my head, but by the time I got 15 pages in, I realized this story was strangely right writing itself. I wrote this fanfic in two days. Yes, I pulled all nighters. Two days? Holy shit. That's a lot of writing for two days. I wish I had that kind of skill. In one of Cindy's vlogs about writing her own book, she opens up about her depression from the tragedies that have occurred this year, 2020, including BLM protests and COVID-19. I think my own depression sort of took over when I was writing this. At first, I just wanted to make a funny story that would make one of my favorite YouTubers smile. And by the end of it, I wanted to write a sweet magical world that helped everyone escape all the shit that's happened this year. Perhaps I leaned into descriptions of cook-offs, restaurants, and cafes because I think we all miss that. We miss the little moments, the fresh donuts and coffee, the festivals, the face-to-face -face minor dramas, romances, and friendships. Aww. Honestly, I really do miss that. I miss just like the normal things of going to a restaurant or going window shopping somewhere or going to a boutique store that has expensive things that you'll never buy but you like to just look at them anyway and imagine. This is what fan fiction is for. It's supposed to be for escapism and this is what we got. I want to thank Cindy for opening up about herself and her life and her vlogs. It's really helped me get through a lot this year. Cindy, I hope you enjoyed this fan fiction as much as I enjoyed researching, binging your videos, and writing it. I hope the jokes made you laugh and the stories touched your heart in some way. Yes, I did specifically try to cater to many things you mentioned liking in many videos. Thank you so much. I did enjoy reading this fan fiction. This was a lot of fun to read and to film, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this also are having a lot of fun. This year honestly has been really tough, so I think any sliver of goodness that we can take is wholeheartedly welcome. This is like such a sweet author's note. Thank you so much for putting this together and putting so much thought into it. Um, I hope if you have made it this far that you enjoyed reading this fan fiction with me and I am gonna go put on deodorant because I am very sweaty right now. Don't forget to unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye. Gonna do it my way, it'll be alright if we burn it